I'm yeah. a sophomore. Yeah. Go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I am the co-chair of the Peace Education Center, as Tom had said. And if I could pick on Tom for a moment, he had it easy. He got the document which already happened. <laughs> and I have to look ahead. And that's really difficult because speculating ahead of time, just what's going to happen, who really knows? The Peace Education Center has always been a local organization that takes on global issues. But with the information that Tom had given in his talk, it's given me some insight on what to speculate looking ahead into the future of the global peace movement. When the global peace and justice communities do look forward, we have a lot of obstacles facing us. Wars over oil would soon be sidelined for wars over fresh water. Food, which is already monopolized by corporations, will continue to take seeds from the hands of farmers and individuals who are capable of produce, producing and securing food for themselves. The current solutions to conflicts we see today, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, Afghanistan, look as though there's no end in sight. Poverty still grips the larger percentage of the world's population. Women around the world still are not treated as equals, and neither are racial, religious, religious and ethnic minority groups. People are still continuing to die because of their sexual orientation. Human trafficking, modern day slavery, is worse than it was in the days when the slave trade was a legitimate industry 150 years ago. Genocide still happens, even though it was sworn that it would never happen on our watch again. When looking at the problems, even just within the United States, we still imprison children for life without parole. We allow the death penalty. We refuse to sign UN treaties, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Treaty for the Rights of the Child. We are a founding nation of the UN and wrote with other founding nations the Declaration of Human Rights, but failed to adhere to the principles we ourselves drafted. We refuse to join the International Criminal Court, for we fear we might be challenged on our actions, such as torture. And these are only a few of the problems that we over we must do something. And we need the majority of the population to get behind us on these issues, or these problems will destroy the future for everyone. But to get the public behind us, we must fight complacency, ignorance, and fear we see in the general population. Now, I just watched a new left media video of the Tea Party on Capitol Hill last weekend. I don't know if any of you have ever seen these Tea Party videos, um, even on the news, when they are up there screaming about what they're, they're trying to defend freedom. They're trying to defend democracy against socialism, fascism, whatever it is they're fighting. But this video was a perfect example of the ignorance we're up against. And when I watched it, I thought this is probably going to be the perfect note of one of the most recent examples that I can give. Blatant racism against a black president is disguised as fear of socialism. And you see it in the signs they have and the pictures they're using. The signs and verbal admissions of violent retaliation against our government were everywhere to be seen and heard. Yet when these people were asked why they were there, it was apparent they really had no idea what they were protesting. They were only told that they should be there because someone on television told them to be angry and afraid. The terms fascism, socialism, and communism were used interchangeably because they didn't know that these were different concepts and they didn't really know what they meant. They were afraid of the czar that Obama was to appoint because Obama represented a shift to communism and the term czar is Russian. But they were rendered speechless when they were told the first drug czar was appointed by Ronald Reagan. <laughs> the role of the czar was greatly expanded by George W. Bush. They also seem to have misunderstood that the term czar is not a communistic term, but the term czar predates communism. When asked what they disliked about the health care plan, they really didn't know. They were just fighting a socialistic health care plan. But when asked if everyone should be insured, they frequently answered, yes, just not with this plan. This plan was dangerous. <laughs> Even better, when asked if instead Medicare should be expanded to include more uninsured people, a protester did say yes. <laughs> These protesters feared becoming like other nations. And at the time, in this video, those nations they feared were being like Canada and Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Even though these nations are faring better than the United States in all major health indexes, including um, infant mortality rates, average life expectancy, very important indexes. 
fear and ignorance kept us from ratifying the treaty, CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Just because Senator Jesse Helms told people it would allow abortions for all women and it would make prostitution a legal profession. It only takes a quick read through this treaty to see that it's not true. Fear and ignorance got us swept up into a wave of patriotism when marching off to the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And these are just examples of the type of fear and ignorance we're up against when we face many justice issues. Ignorance and fear is perpetuated by those who benefit from the status quo. And those in power have the means to spread their message of nationalism, isolationism, ignorance, and fear through, to the people through mass media channels. It's a lot for us to compete with. So how do we continue, continue for, forward when the future looks so bleak? Well, all throughout history, the peace communities have faced what looked like unstoppable forces. And even now, we cannot lose hope. We cannot let despair or anger, though righteous as this anger may be, take over and blind us from that purpose. Naomi Klein wrote, we activists, whether grassroots organizers, researchers, or theorists, tend to hop from atrocity, one atrocity to the next. Sweatshops, poisons, sickness, war, until we are pickled in horror. Gradually our beliefs, rather than flowing from love for what we are protecting or building, start to flow from more dangerous sources, rage and bitterness. She's right. For even I have found myself angry, spouting off about how people are allowing terrible injustices to take place, and for those who know me well, know that this spouting usually includes a stream of obscenities. <laughs> They're laughing because they know. But going back to what Tom talked about, the past successes of the peace and justice community, should give us all hope. All along, we, the peace and justice communities, have been fighting against such atrocities and the ignorance and fear that goes with them. Ignorance in its most dangerous form as it is based on racism, sexism, classism, or just plain the other. We've always been there, educating the masses and using grassroots activists to, feed, to defeat this ignorance, fear, and complacency one person at a time until our voices collectively are too loud Injustices that looked impossible to overcome have been overcome. Suffrage, civil rights, the end of apartheid, peaceful independence movements around the globe. The list goes on with successes of those before us. We fight the ignorance that allows people to commit an injustice or to stand idly by while people suffer around them with education. Education takes many forms through art, music, theater, protests, articles, photographs, books, le lectures, the list goes on and on. Everything we do out there in the world is educating those who see and hear us. And we educate because we have to believe that people are inherently good. And that once they learn that the other is human, is like them, and they can relate to their suffering, we have to believe they will do what they can to stop it. We've been successful because we're persistent. The peace and justice community knows that the impossible will take a little while, and we persist because we celebrate the small, small successes that come with that. People will not always respond in favor when they first hear our message, but eventually truth wins and public opinion will begin to sway in our favor. And I say truth because whenever you err on the side of humanity, that's the truth. Today, even seeing a discussion after the siege in Gaza in the press and on Capitol Hill about the plight of the Palestinians is the beginning of a success. The silence has been broken. People are not afraid to challenge Israel as an infallible being. The silence has been broken, which is the essential first step. That is something we can celebrate in and move forward with. And even if we don't have the mass media market, once we're out there, the debate begins. We still move forward, we persist, our message is heard. Eventually our, our numbers will add up, even only one person at a time, at a time, and a movement is born. The global peace movement has always been there to move humanity forward. Even when we have been mocked and ridiculed, such as in our protests leading up to the Iraq war, we now find the press and the rest of society catching up to what we've been saying all along about this war. It started on the basis of a lie. We make a difference. So in my own simple opinion, hope, education, persistence, this is the past, present, and future of the global and local peace movement in whatever form it takes. 
These are the essential elements to what have led many great people before us into creating a better world. And I have to believe that we too can take these lessons and successes of the past and overcome the impossible to create a better world as well. We can end war. We can pressure our government to conform to UN principles we drafted. We can actually stand out there and make a difference on all of these issues that I have talked about previously and make a better